Countdown. Okay, live stream started. And can you unmute the mics? We're good? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Cree Language Learning and Writing, a conversation with Solomon Ratt. We are streaming to YouTube Live from Forspace, located on unceded Indigenous lands here in Chijage, Montreal. And we'd like to extend our gratitude, our gratitude to the Kionkahaga Nation, who are caretakers for the lands and waters that we are meeting on, and <clears throat> for their teachings about the earth and our relations to it. At Fourth Space, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities that examine research questions and projects that are in development here at the university. We're running this event as a live stream meeting, and so we welcome all of your comments and questions with a raised hand or via the chat if you're joining by Zoom. And for those of you who are here in the space, if you'd like to participate, just let us know by raising a hand. We'll get a microphone to you. And with that, it's my pleasure now to hand over uh, the microphone over to René from the Observatoire de la Traduction Autochtone here at University Concordia. René, over to you. Uh, je m'appelle René Lemieux et je vous souhaite la bienvenue au nom de l'Observatoire de la traduction autochtone de l'Université Concordia, dont je suis le responsable. Uh, je vais bientôt uh, céder la, la parole aux, uh, aux, uh, aux personnes, aux panélistes ici qui vont, uh, qui vont, uh, qui vont discuter donc de, la, de, de, de traduction de langue et d'enseignement de la langue cri. But first, Here's a brief presentation. Uh, Manon Tremblay is Senior Director of the Indigenous Directions here at Concordia. She is Neia Iskwil from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. She will lead the conversation. Solomon Ratt has been a professor of Cree language and literature at the First Nations University of Canada for over 30 years. Through his work, uh, he inspired thousands of students and community members ac across the country. Solomon is from the community of Stanley Mission in Northern Saskatchewan. He was born in 1954 in a trapper's cabin along the banks of the Churchill River. Cree is Solomon's first language, and he grew up learning all the traditional stories in Cree. Although Solomon was sent to the Indian residential school in Prince Albert as a child, he managed to keep his Cree fluency into adulthood. His last book, Kapi Isi Kis Kisiyan, The Way I Remember, published recently at the University of Regina, Regina Press, recounts Solomon's memories from the, res, uh, from the residential schools as well as traditional stories learned from people of his community. Tawau. And now I give the floor to uh, Solomon. Greetings to all of you. Thank you all for coming and I thank uh, Concordia University here to for asking me to to come speak to you people. And I'll leave it for you to take it oh, and do, do a, a little more introduction because <laughs> um, I haven't planned this. <laughs> well, we're just going to wing it. Okay. Um, but before I start, actually, I wanted to offer you a little something since mm -hmm. you're going to be speaking. Okay. Hey. And um, so um, today, um, we're going to be talking to, to Solomon Ratt. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, Solomon has been active for many, many years, in fact, decades, in uh, uh, teaching the, uh, the Cree language to a new generation of speakers. His work has been extremely important because, um, as you know, you know um, most of the indigenous languages of this world are endangered. 
some are in better shape than others, and Cree is one of them, actually, in better shape than others. Cree has the most speakers by far in Canada than any other Indigenous language combined. In fact, on Turtle Island, we are second only to Navajo. So we do have quite a few speakers, but that doesn't mean that we need to be complacent. Um, it means that we need to continue our efforts in teaching the next generation of uh, Cree speakers so that our language keeps uh, growing in, uh, in numbers. And Solomon has been one of these people that has been um, working on this uh, for, for many, many years. And uh, so we're going to be hearing from him. Uh, Solomon, I think you have a presentation to show yeah, us. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll start off with a presentation. And uh, if we could have it on screen. Okay, so my man and the gig is going to have a go in. I think this is Matt Siano. That's a long time ago. I was taught how to live on this earth. You go, go get the extra max Siano to get the extra max to go. I'm going to go to the gig. I guess go up the exit. No, I'm going to get to think the gig. I'm going to get the extra max to win. That's good. I'm going to get the extra max to win. I'm going to get the extra max to win. A long time ago, I was taught from the land. My education was in the land, from the land. I was uh, first six years of my life. I was uh, living with my parents on the Churchill River, and my education was through living during daily. Winter time was story time. And as I grew up and I went to university, I met one of my mentors, Dr. Ahab Spence, who used to say, you know, we should have our education like we used to do in the old days. We should have land-based education, have our, ha, have our topics based on what we did during that time of year. Like berry picking in the late summer and, and early fall, moose hunting in the late, late fall, early fall, all that stuff. We should have our education system work this way. And so from him, I started thinking on this preview of education on, on what is you see on the screen right now. Preview of education, Native American stories for all ages encourage inferred meanings, focus on cooperation, stress the importance of establishing, nurturing, and negotiating relationships with oneself, with others, and with one's circumambience. Did I write that? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> Thus, education is holistic. It involves Sometimes I amaze myself, you know, never mind. Okay, <laughs> thus education is holistic. It involves the creator, Mother Earth, the community, and it leads to nurturing and human empowerment. It is ongoing from the moment of birth until one leaves for the spirit world. It is all inclusive, regardless of race, color, or creed. Being all inclusive, it is thus multicultural education before the concept of multicultural education came into vogue. I was putting a nail in my educator in my to my teachers at the University of Arizona who were teaching me multicultural education. This is where that comes from. Okay. A curriculum toward First Nations education can be developed based on the organization chart on Cree ways of knowing below. Cree ways of knowing, there are four things to consider. Emotional, Mosistawid, spirituality, Manituatsuin, physical skills, and Matawisuin, psychological. And each of these four things could go into separate units on their own. Like, for example, we go into physical skills. Well, that's just for, just for example. And we could go into physical skills, four ways of looking at physical skills. Education, arts and crafts, nature's bounty, storytelling, and then what? Those four units again could go into other sections. Others, let's go into uh, nature's bounty. Nature's bounty could be divided into hunting, matchiwin, fishing, nochiginusiwiwin, gathering, manahusuin, and trapping, winahigiwin. And then from there, we'll go into. Uh, I'm trying to move down screen here. Okay. And from there, we could go into other units. Okay, we could go into nature's bounty, as I said a little while ago. And from nature's bounty, we'd go into fishing. No, you're going to see we win. Types of nature, types of fishing, right? Whereas Bagitahua, uh, we with fishing with nets and types of fish. 
traditional fishing, angling, preparing fish, now can you imagine the vocabulary in the in indigenous languages involved in all these lessons? And taking our students out into the land using these, these lessons, using the vocabulary and getting the students to do all this stuff in the language. And that's the idea of this thing. This is key ways of knowing. It's total involvement, it's education. You're out on the land, you practice these, these things. And this is how I was taught before I got taken away. As I like to say in the book, my education was interrupted by my schooling. Then I got taken to residential school. I no longer had these, these lessons anymore, except for two years, two months of the year, I went, I went home. And then we were, we were doing this. So but you could organize a whole education curriculum on creator knowing by looking at all this stuff here. There are four main subordinates under Cree Ways of Knowing. Each of these subordinates can only have, can have any number of subordinate headings and so on. For example, subordinates physical skills include education, arts and crafts, nature's bounty and storytelling. Subordinate to that is nature's bounty includes the various ways of harvesting and so on, as I have said before. Corpus planning under this type of organization chart will require community involvement which is often ignored in the mainstream education systems. Community has to be involved with this kind of education. Sociolinguistic extension, of course, intertranslatability, graphic adaptation, and technological adaptation. In addition to the list above, there will be a need for material development, materials development in a way of picture, picture files, interactive fiction games, readers, and build up building field trip plans within the community. Let's work backwards. Readers, we are organizing a lot of readers nowadays. We, ha we have books coming out in our in various indigenous languages. I had a hard time acquiring the English language when I was a kid. But I really picked up when I tapped into these uh, readers in grade five where everything was, we had a page, a read a page, and then we had asked questions about what I just read. There were graded readers, and we started from yellow all the way to black, you know, depending on how skillful you became. And that's what I like to see. You build, like the yellow reader was very easy to read, not very hard vocabulary. And that's the kind of stuff that I went through in grade five. And I was able to pick up English faster because of that. Because the readers, the designers of these readers, thought of the kids, how can they learn? Easy first, more, more complex, and very complex, all the way down the line. And we need to organize readers like that. And we have this book here, which is really nice. It's a Tapway Gohmastawastotan. It's a book by, by uh, Buffy St. Marie. She wrote this book in, uh, in English. And a, few, a couple of years ago, she asked me to translate it for her, which I did. So I've got the Cree copy. And, uh, but you could get the English copy and you could also get the Cree copy. Buffy Saint, and you could get an audio book for this. Buffy St. Marie does the narration for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the English. I did the narration for the Cree. So you could get audio books like that. So these are available. That takes us into technological stuff here on there. Fiction, interactive fiction games, where you have a set of uh, data a little story developing and you, you create a problem for the reader and they have to solve that problem okay say you come upon you come upon uh i'll just use your in in, 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 in. <laughs> you come upon a, a a batch of um of blueberries and you want to feed your family do you want to take one berry or do you want to take a lot of berries you know so you, you give big in in, 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 in. Take one berry or a choice. Now we saw he take lots of berries, harvest lots of berries. And the student reads that and they say, okay, I'll just take the one berry. And he clicks on the one berry and gets shot to the room and says, you just died. You're too selfish. <laughs> that kind of stuff is interactive fiction because it teaches concepts, right? And uh, 
And we did this, we developed these things back in 1986 and stuff, and uh, drag to fiction games never went anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, uh, you know, like sometimes we do things and they don't go anywhere. Uh, could we get to the next screen, please? Oh, I have it. Okay. So here we go. One of our treaty rights was to get was to get materials for making fishnets during treaty days. And I used to watch my mother and dad making their own net after that, after they get the twine. So we'd have all this stuff and they'd make their own net, fishnet. We'd have this needle for, needle for the nets. That be was Sabun again. And then she makes a net, that be Keu. So he's making a net. And then we have the floaters, and then we have the twine for the, for the net, and we have uh, a rope itself, and then we have the other bee for the net, and a sneezak, and the weights, hit, the lead weights at the bottom, a sneezak. Little, little stones, in other words, you know. Create a lesson based on this stuff. Get the students to make a net, and then take them out to the lake to set the nets. This is all community involvement. The people who know how to make nets can come into the classroom to help make these nets. This is happening. Uh, Community-based education and uh, land-based education is happening all across Canada, in, in a, lot, a lot of communities all across Canada. The only drawback about these things, it's a good idea, but a lot of these land-based education endeavors are all done in English. And I say, what's the point? And they say, if we did that, the students wouldn't understand anyway. But children are very smart. They will pick up the language when they hear it. When they hear it often, they will pick up. When they see somebody making a net and talking about what they're doing in Cree in, or in whatever language, the ch children will understand. In that way, they're learning the culture itself, and they're also learning the language that goes with, 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 with this. It's really good. And then we have the word list that you could work with. As a teacher, you're working with, with, with the word list all the way down the line. Just really neat. Okay, let's have a, uh, another slide, please. So this is all deals with la language learning, language teaching. How far do you want to go with your, with your teaching, right? And we have all these words that you could work with within the classroom. Let's go to the snowshoe. I think it's further down. There we go, that one. Sam, snowshoe. The importance of making sure you spell right. The top word there, see the little hat over the, over, <laughs> over the, the little hat over the A? If I did not have that little hat over the A, it's, not, it's called a circumflex, by the way, but everybody calls it a hat, but it's a circumflex, okay? If I didn't have that little hat on that A, we'd have a different word. We'd have a word telling somebody, feed someone. The way that says, Assam, Assam, which is snowshoe. Assam is feed someone. So spelling is important to be able to get that idea across. So we have this snowshoe. My dad makes snowshoes like this. I've never seen anybody else make snowshoes like that. <laughs> okay. A samastic, you know, the, a samastic is a, the wood you use for uh, birch wood, actually, you use to, to do that. And what he did with that wood is he, he put that wood in the, in, the, in the water. He just soaked the wood in the water, and he eventually took his time bending it like that. Oh, it took about a week, I think, and just bending it like this. And uh, 
is really, really, really good. And then we have the asamatic, uh, that's asamatic, the word itself, atipisa, the, uh, the weaving stuff is out, the, the twine that goes in there. And then the uh, the couscous, the binding for the, for the on the couscous, the binding for, for your boots onto, the snow, onto your snow. And atim, uh, atimana, couscous is uh, the, the bar that goes across, sorry. And that atim, atimana is uh, are the bindings for the for the shoes. And the couscous is the ba is the bar in there. And bisiminabia and and then of course all these things here. Osito, a mac weaving needle for snowshoes, notimeo and all that stuff. So we have these things to work with. So we need to to do that. And you have this situation. You you give them a picture to work with, and you give them the vocabulary, and you can actually get them to make little snowshoes in the classroom, just little re uh, replicas of real snowshoes, if you want, because I've seen, I've seen uh, other classrooms where the students are, are getting to make tiny Birch bark canoes, and yeah, I just really need, and and you need the vocabulary in Cree for uh, for that too, and it's really neat, and and uh, uh, colleagues of mine uh, have uh, have these uh, land based classes where they're making canoes, birch bark canoes up in northern Saskatchewan, and they show us the, the process itself, and the complete canoe itself. But you know what? I have never seen one of their canoes float. That's the ultimate test. Is it going to float? So I tease them about that all the time. Maybe next summer they'll get one floating. But you have to be really good in making stuff like this. Okay, let's have a, uh, don't know what else is here. Next slide. Thank you. Everything happens in language, no matter what culture you come from. Okay, in Cree specifically, we look at these things, but other cultures also have these, including the English culture, they have, everything happens through language. All knowledge is done through language. And here we have our Cree language going in. In storytelling, what do we have in storytelling? We have oratory. Long time ago, we had really good orator. Or, <laughs> what's the word I'm thinking? We had people were really good at oratory, speaking in public, in council. That was part of our culture to be able to speak well in in uh, in our language. And, uh, this at lunch today, we were talking about words, uh, telling somebody to keep quiet or shut up. <laughs> This is really neat. I love the way things go together, you know. And uh, one of the words for telling somebody to shut up is kiampi. Kiampi. It means kiam is you may as well, or it's okay. And api is sit. You may as well sit down, young fella. You're not making any sense. That kind of stuff, right? And uh, that harks back to our oratory. And then we have play, lots of play. The business of kid and childhood is play. That's how a child learns, is to play. And then we have stories. I loved stories when I was a kid. Yeah, when I was a kid, what am I talking about? I love stories now. <laughs> but we have stories. My mom and dad would tell us stories in the winter on the trap line. I remember lighting up a candle, feeding the wood on the fire, crackling fire, and we'd lay down. My brothers and I would lay down. My older sisters were already at the residential school, so they weren't with us that time. So it was just my, me and my brothers listening to the stories. And they tell stories, and my brothers fall asleep right away. I'm still up. 
bit after. Solomon, Solomon, can I bounce you? Hey, hey, in the band. Solomon, are you awake? Are you asleep? I said, yeah, I'm asleep. And my father would say, nipa, nipa, and he goes, sleep, sleep well, nip, my son, you know. And then they'd keep on telling the stories. And the next night, we'd pick up again with the storytelling. And my mother would say, where were we? Before, before, you know, and my older brother would say the last story he heard. So I'd get to hear a repeat of the story previously. Somebody asked me, how do you remember these stories? That's how I remember these stories. Because <laughs> I'd hear the story twice in one winter time, you know, just really great. And, uh, and so this went on until I went to residential school. After that, I didn't hear stories anymore. The first winter of storytelling, of, of no stories, it's really weird. We had TV, you know, we had English everywhere. But after 10 months of the year being in residential school, I went home. And I asked my dad, mom and dad, can you tell me stories? And they told me, no, we can't tell you stories. It's summertime. We only tell stories in the wintertime. So they never told stories after that. So I had to go and explore myself. And I went to the library. I was a, I was a reader all the time. And I went to the library and I found Edward Ahenicus Sacred tales, sacred stories of the, uh, what's it's called? The Sweet Rascal. Hmm? The Sweet Rascal. Uh, no, 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 it's uh, Edward uh, Henneke, uh Creed Trickster Tales. Yes. Yeah, that was there. Creed Trickster mm -hmm. Tales. Uh, 1929 edition in, in folklore. And, uh, and I read all these stories that I had heard when I was a kid, you know, from the library. It was really great. And, uh, they were all in Crete. They were all in English. And then I ran into uh, Ella E. Clark's Native Legends of Canada. And I read some of the stories that my mom and dad had told me. But they were so... What's the polite word? <laughs> <laughs> she left a lot of stuff out of those things. And I'm trying to be polite here, you know, you know, but I still was able to get those stories and I recognize the stories from the, mem the ones my mom told us, you know, it's just really great. And, uh, so the stories were coming back to me. And then in university, I went to the library again and I found Leonard Bloomfield's Sweet Grass, Sweet Grass stories. And they were just really nice. On one side of the page, we had English. Once we saw each was walking along when he came upon a nest of startlers. Hello, Jimmy Dick. Hey, younger brothers, where what's your name? And the younger sibling and the and the little grouse said, Oh, we can't tell you that. Our mother told us never tell you our name, so we can't tell you that. Oh, come on, younger brothers, you know everybody's got Two names here, like me, I'm older brother, and I'm also Isaki Chuck. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have another name. Well, our parents told us not to tell her our secret name was Okoskohoe Isaac. Startlers, startlers, ha! You guys are much too small to startle anybody. And right there, he dot, 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 dot. <laughs> he laughed at them and went on his way. What is this dot, dot, dot? There's something missing in this English text. Bloomfield's text, it's like that. But you could go into the Cree section. If you know how to read Cree, you can say, you can see it's all in there. So <laughs> as soon as the, in Cree it says, hey, my yoga with the my yoga with the new way, you can tell got the me sat that to stick on the head, you can tell. And you got back behind you to sit with it. Which means once the younger starters told them his name, he immediately shot on their, on their heads and started laughing as he walked away. <laughs> now, the big question is, if we revive our legends, our, our, our traditional tales, are we going to include that in the, in the, in the stories? I do. Mm -hmm. 
I used to get invited to elementary schools to tell stories. <laughs> uh, key word is used to. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I'm sorry that I came to the, the class today and he told us about this guy shitting on the bird's heads. <laughs> hey, principal, I heard what happened in the schools. <laughs> Oh boy, it's up to us, right? What do we do with us? Because one of the things, of these naughty things about of these elements in Cree, is basically it helped us to feel comfortable with our bodily functions. It helped us feel comfortable with our bodies by looking at the humor behind all this stuff here. It helped us accept ourselves to who we are and what we do. And there's also a very sacred lesson in that story of the structures. It's about our names, our ceremonial names. We protect those. We do not write those sacred names on a tattoo on our arms for everybody to see. We do not put it on Facebook for the rest of the world. These are sacred things. These are some of the lessons that, are, that have been left out because we no longer tell our stories. There's a little fly here. <laughs> we no longer tell our stories, unfortunately, and we no longer tell our stories in the wintertime. There's very few people who actually tell stories in the wintertime. And a few of us have decided, you know, nobody's telling these stories anymore. So let's tell the stories whenever we can. We'll tell them even in the summertime. A few of us are trying that. So far, we're getting a lot of a lot of flack. So, how do we handle that? I say it's okay to read them. <laughs> Shall I tell you the story of the startlers? I could read it. I prefer to telling it. Once Yusakita was walking about, when all of a sudden he saw Baby Grouse. Ho, oh, honorable younger siblings, says he to them. The Baby Grouse looked at him. Honorable younger siblings, Baby Grouse, how are you called? You already named us when you said Baby Grouse. That's how we are called. No, everyone has more than one name, like me. Yusakita is my name, and I am also called oldest brother. Now, how are you called? We can't tell you. Our parents told us not to tell our other name, startlers, as we are called. Ha! Startlers, he laughed at them. Bosh, startlers. My prick, startlers, he said, as he began to shit on them. And those he missed, he picked up and used them to wipe himself. That portion was actually in Leonard Prunefield's mm -hmm. book, in the, in the Cree part. In the English part, it was dot, 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 dot. <laughs> <laughs> but it is there, right? It, it, this story I'm reading is also in here. So a couple of you are, are reading that along with me. Okay. Startler, you are too small to scare, me, to scare me, he said, beginning to leave. The parents were so surprised when they got home. Who did this? Holy, you sure stink. You, they said. And what was talking talk? Cried one baby girl. He tricked us to tell with our other name. As soon as he said, Startler, he shit on us. Just you wait, Wisakita, said the female grouse. She called all her tribesmen to have a meeting. They went to wait along the river where Wisakita usually jumped across. Eventually, this man arrives, still laughing at the startler. Startler, ha, boy. He arrives along the river. Hmm, let's see, I'll jump across. First, he backs up, then from there, he runs, and just as he reaches the river, he stops. Gigach, almost, he says. You see the baby grouse fly up from the bushes. He backs up again, and again he begins to run. Almost, he says, and once again he stops. He sees two baby girls flying up from the bush. He backs up again, and again he begins to run, this time from a little ways out further. Almost, he says, and once again he stops. He sees three baby girls flying up from the bush. He backs up again, and this time he runs from, from further away. Just as he began his jump, lots of girls flew out from the bushes. Wow, he was so startled that he landed in the water. 
The girls laughed at him saying their name. And that's the length of the story about the starters. <laughs> so we can't tell the stories in the summer. Let's read them. And we have stories there. And we have stories in this book. And we have stories here. And we have stories in here also. There are lots of resources out there. When I first started teaching in 1984, we had nothing to work with. So we have, and uh, I was, I took my first Cree class at university level from uh, Anna, the late Anna Crow, and we worked with a book called, uh, I don't know, what's it, what's it called? Mary Edwards Cree. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Meet Cree. Or, no, it's not Meet Cree. I can't remember what it's called. Nehe or something like that. It was Mary Edwards Cree book that we worked with, mm -hmm. and we had, uh, we had, there was terrible stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, we had things like that. <laughs> the things like that. Yeah, don't drink, pray. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, he was mad at her husband. So he, she hit him over the head with a frying pan. <laughs> this was the stuff in the textbook we were working with in Cree 100 way back when, back in 1980. So what happened was we, did, we weren't happy with that book. So Gino Gimasis wrote a book mm -hmm. called Cree Language of the Plains. And from there, we started writing. Gino Gimasis is one of my mentors. And uh, I co-wrote the book there. With, she wrote the book herself first. And then, I, and then she put my name on there because I helped with the workbook. And uh, that's why my name appears on there. That's a relic, by the way. <laughs> a historical piece in here guarded with your life <laughs> and, uh, and that led to other books and uh, which More is really neat person. and this is really nice my, that book, my name's on that book okay. still you know but you could get this without without her without her, they're here they arrived <laughs> <laughs> two friends from ottawa just showed up thank you and uh, so you could get this online now the Cree language of the plains you could actually get a free copy online for Cree grammar it's under Gino Gimaz's name. Gino Gimaz's Cree Language of the Plains. You could get it online. And then, and then I started writing. Um, one of the things that I must, must mention is that there was hardly anything to work with back then. But then Gino Gimaz started, and then Frida Henniku started writing her stuff, which, which was really a good thing to do because Frida Henniku would would write stories from interviews she did with elders. And she also published books from uh, student stories. And she also did her own traditional stories of, of traditionals in Cree and in English. So there's going to be a lot of materials being published in Cree through Fida Henneke. And a few of us follow suit. She was a leader and a few of us just follow suit. And one of her uh, students was uh, Eric Wolvengray, was one of her students. And he did the same thing in Cree in this word. But we had that Jamuinsa, funny little stories. This, story, this book is actually a, a book of stories written by our students at First Nations University, following Frida's example. And it was really nice. And it's really a lot of funny stories on this one. I am going to tell you the story the way I heard it quite a while ago told by my mother in Prince Albert where she lives. Once upon a time, she said, these two old ladies, she said, from somewhere up north, she said, ah, they were sitting in the restaurant, she said, as they were drinking coffee and having a bite to eat, she said. And there was also another, a man sitting close by, she said, and he too was eating, she said. Suddenly this man calls out to the waitress and says to her, hey, waitress, would you please bring me some yam? He said, Audibly. Well, this one old lady started laughing tumultuously as she poked her friend, telling her, Good grief, my sister in law. Did you hear that, man? She exclaimed, She can't even say jam. This is where the story ends. <laughs> Funny little stories, and it's really wonderful. And so we now have uh, resources to do 
to be able to work with. Language teachers can have resources they could work with. Go through the Cree part and teach the lesson as you go along. Get the students to act out the stories they hear. I'm going to read a story told by the late Mary Louise Rock Thunder. Her autobiography was just published last year. And we're going to have a book opening next week on that. But that stuff, Mary, Ro Mary Louise Rock Thunder's autobiography is just, the book's been out for over a year, but we just didn't have uh, a time to, for a book launch because of COVID. So we'll have a book launch this October. But this is one of the stories she wrote in here. And uh, it's really neat. It's just a little story about that. Okay, this is uh, that Jean and Eric did together. On March 23rd, 2001, at the Cree Language Retention Committee, sponsored by Language Teachers Workshop in Saskatoon, Mary Louise Rockthunder narrated this Wisaki Stock story for the amusement of all in attendance. Jean had worked with Mary Louise on a number of occasions and has a number of different stories, which we hope will form a larger publication in the future, which is now out, by the way. So this was. This was back in 2007. <laughs> now we're in 2003, finally, that book is out. For now, we would like to offer this story in memory of Mary Louise Rockthunder, who left us for the spirit world on July 2nd, 2004, at the age of 90. So this is how she tells her story. This story is also on, on here, on different, a little slight different version. And uh, as my big brother says, we saki such stories are common, are public domain, so go for it. <laughs> Because I wanted to steal one of his stories, which I'll tell later. And they said, hey, same as, actually, is my younger brother. Hey, younger brother, can I steal your Wisaki Zuck story? Said, brother, Wisaki Zuck story is a public domain. Go for it. <laughs> so here's Wisaki Zuck eats his scab. Okay, I think it's in here if you want to follow it. I think it's the second last story. It's on uh, 294, Usagi Tuck and the Marking of Birch Trees. Mm -hmm. That's where that is, it's in there, okay? Okay, here's Mary Louise Rock Thunder's version of this. I love, I love hearing stories from other, other versions of stories. Once upon a time, Usagi Tuck was walking along. He was walking, with, he was walking, Usagi Tuck was. Oh my goodness, it seems he was really craving that which his grandmother would roast him. Mmm, kakewak, dried meat. Oh my, he wanted to eat it, but she didn't. Well, because he was a very big man, this old man with Saki Tuck, his grandmother wasn't going to feed him. Gee whiz, he was really hungry. Well, so he left his grandmother. So then he wandered about, but that's with Saki Tuck for you. He's always walking. My goodness, but he was very hungry. Well, then he spotted some rose hips and they were really re red. So those were the ones now for he was hungry. So then he really gobbled up a great quantities of those rose hips, a great many. All right, my little brothers, now I'm really full. What are you called? Oh, rose hips. Yes, but only that, it's, it's compulsory that among people, there are two names. So my little brothers, you should not call yourselves by the name rose hips alone. One, those, these here rose hips were at a loss for what other name they had than this one large rose hip spoke up saying, oh, elder brother, we are called little butt itchers. You heard that? Little butt itchers. Oh, oh my goodness, you have a truly hideous name. Ah, since you are so many of us, since you ate so, such a great amount, then when nature calls, it's going to have quite a bad effect on your, on your over there. Uh, you will, you will really get itchy down there. Point with your lips. Remember that. <laughs> ah, there's nothing to these little butt itchers, itchers, he said, merely left and walked on. My goodness, I guess he had been on his way for a while. Oh my, but then he kept itching over there. And eventually he tore the scab loose over there, over here from where he voids down there. And he walked on. Well, goodness, my grandmother was leaving tracks along here. The ones whose dried, the one whose dried meat I wanted. He started tracking her. 
but it was himself that he was tracking. There he found some really dry kakewak. Here it had a hole in the middle of it. He took it up. Oh, yes, my grandmother must have dropped her dried meat to the stuff I wanted. Usaki took it up and started eating right then. Oh, my, really, he really started getting really very full. All of a sudden, some birds were singing, We suck it, eat his own scab. Whoa, my little brothers, from where might the scab come from? We suck it, would eat. It's my grandmother's dried meat that I'm eating. Well, nevertheless, these birds kept singing, and he started to recognize this from over here where one voids. The hole, uh, that which he had let had that which he had let drop was somewhat orange and it was due to the rose hips that he was itchy. Oh no, these younger brothers of mine are telling the truth. It appears I have, was really eating my own scab. <laughs> that is that's it, all right. That's how this sacred story is always told. This is one of them. How should I speak? We sack it like his own scab. <laughs> Can I hear a different version of that? Do we have time? We have time, right? You've answered most of my questions, so we have plenty of time. <laughs> uh, what was the question? <laughs> Actually, I had some questions that were related to some of these stories. Okay. Because um, <clears throat> I was raised with these stories too, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> my Kukum and Mushum left off some of these dot, dot, dot sometimes, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, actually, one of the ones that uh, Leonard Bloomfield mentions, you know, with the dot, 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 is when Wisa um, Ketak pretends to be a week ago. And um, he walks into. Um, Wisa Ketak pretends to be a Wistiko and he walks into a camp full of women. All the men are off hunting. And then there's a dot, 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 right? And then, <laughs> and then Wisa Ketak goes on his way. So if you only get the English version, you went like, what the heck just happened? Um, <laughs> and then the story ends with one of the women going like, uh, did something happen to you? Like, what, what would happen? And another woman speaks up and says, I don't know, but I wish the Wistiko would come back. <laughs> but, da, 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 da. Da, 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 yes. but I was wondering if you could explain maybe to our audience why it is that we cannot tell sacred stories outside of winter. I mean, I know what my Kokum and Mushum told me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I've heard is if you do the stories in the summertime, uh, snakes are crawling into your teepee, is what I heard. Oh, PA sure will get you. Yeah, that's what I get. Yeah, yeah. Snakes, snakes for me. Yeah, and they'll get you. Yeah, okay. But let's look at it realistically. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're in northern Saskatchewan. All right, the sun sets around 11 o'clock back in my home area at night during the height of summer. The sun stays up for a long time. Little kids play out until the sun, the sun falls. They play outside, and by 11 o'clock at night, when the sun starts setting, they're tired and they fall right to sleep. Winter time, sun sets around four o'clock, five o'clock. Children are still active like crazy, right? In the old days, there was no TV, no Wi Fi, no phones. What are you going to do? Feed the children, hope they go to bed right away. Feed the children. Tell them stories until they fall asleep. So they did that. So it's very logistical. It's very a very logistical thing to do. That's why that's one of the reasons why I say let's tell our stories when we can, because we're losing a lot of these lessons that are involved in the stories. We're losing that the importance of sacred names. And the importance of respecting everybody, like we saw Jack shitting on the little bird's heads, does not show respect to those little birds. We also have lost the lesson of being honorable in our intentions. 
because when the Wisaki Tak approaches the little birds, he addresses them in the honorific form, the same dick, a T I K. The little birds know that with that dick, the same dick, that Wisaki Tak's intentions are going to be honorable. But he does something totally different. The little birds got tricked. But the little birds were expecting honor, an honorable intentions from Wisaki Jack because of that tick, and same tick. And we see that constantly in this day and age. A leader will come up and say, That's in Wakumagana tick. Wakumagana tick. Those people who are raised in Cree know that this honorable, this man has, is showing honorable intentions. And then goes ahead and takes a band fence and goes to goes casino hunting. <laughs> Doesn't do anything honorable, right? <laughs> but, but people are still in tune to that. And they forget that honorific. If you're, if you're talking about honor, then live the honor, show honor to the people you have. But this is getting lost in our in our story because we don't longer tell our stories. We're, we're missing these lessons nowadays. My band tried to have stories in uh, in the elementary schools one time, so they could bring the stories back, and uh, they didn't last long. A lot of parents didn't want the stories told within the, within the school time. I guess they were they were devil stories. So Solomon, in your book, in this book here, mm -hmm. um, you tell a story about Santa Claus arriving by bush plane. Yeah. And uh, I really like that story. But you know, in the Cree version, you refer to Santa Claus as Wisaketa. Yeah. So I've never heard that connection before between, right? that, between it, yeah. It must be just Northern Saskatchewan because we call Santa Claus Wisakijak. Okay. Remember, Wisakijak is an older brother. Yes. He's mostly addressed as an older brother. Yeah. So that's why Wisakijak, the Santa Claus comes and gives gifts, right? That's what older brothers do. Older brothers take care of the younger ones. So that's why we call them Wisaki okay. Jack from there. And, um, you know, a lot of the, well, most of the, fun, the, 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 the stories of, of Wisaki Jack are funny, you know, and my Mushuma and Kukum used to say that it was like these, these stories, like they, they all contain lessons. And they always used to say, if you want to be a good Cree, you don't act like Wisaki Jack, right. you know? Um, but um, one of the things that always struck me is that, you know, the creation story, um, our creation story, the Cree people, uh, it's a very violent story. You know, the story of Rolling Head and Earth Man, and these are the parents of Wisa Getak. And I always wondered why it was that these first stories of Wisa Getak as a child are so violent, you know, and, and then there is a progression towards these stories becoming very funny, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. What's really interesting about, about the, our creation stories is uh, Wisaki Chuck carries his young, the younger brother yeah. to escape Rolling Head. Mm -hmm. And no matter how tough things got, he never abandons his younger brother. That's the main lesson of the Rolling yeah. Head story is that if you're older, you take care of those younger than you. And uh, Wisaki Chuck's parents end up getting killed in this story but the father makes sure that his sons have four things mm -hmm. that will help them in their escape. And these four things are the four elements, create the four elements, which show us our connection to the world. Like he's running away from this rolling head and the first thing he throws is an aphid and you know, immediately Th thorns sh show up and stops the rolling head and the rolling head has to go through these thorns and get all scratched up and you know that's the plants themselves the air giving us air right and then rolling head continues following the boys and the next thing he sees is a uh, is a uh, is rolling head is getting closer and closer and so he picks up another one throws it behind him and immediately rocks spring up in the blocking the rolling head and the rolling head manage, manages to get across across the rocks but i'm, not, I'm just outlining the story the story is in here and uh, and so the boys keep running and the next thing he sees 
he uses it as a, as a flint and he throws it in the back and immediately fire springs up behind him, stopping the rolling head for a while. But the rolling head just goes right through the fire, singeing his hair, and it's just all black. You know? and, uh, and the next thing you see is a, is a beaver tooth, and he's, and he's so tired by this time, you know, he's just trying to throw it back, back and, uh, but it falls in front of him. And there is a river in front of him, stopping him. And two old bitterns come by and say, oh, grandchildren, do not, do not cry. I'll let, let you go across, sit on my back, and away we go. So he take us, takes him across the river, and the rolling head comes along and convinces the bitterns, oh, take me across. Oh, I can't do that. Take me across, and I'll be your wife. Oh, okay, that sounds good. Okay. So... But don't get onto my neck if I have a sore neck. So, so the rolling head gets on the back of the bittern and they go one across. It could be a bittern or a swan, swan or a pelican. It depends on the storyteller. And, and, and the rolling head is getting more excited as he goes to the shore and he starts jumping on the, on the poor bird's neck and it gets thrown into the water and becomes fish. Nemeo, sturgeon, the main source of food for the northern people for the longest time. So we have these four elements coming into play. But it also the way Edward Ahenikou explains it is basically also shows the migration pattern of the Cree people from the Great Lakes region to the American Southwest where there are cacti, and then back again into, into the, against the Rockies, where the Rockies get, and back into the Great Plains, where the fire, right? The fire burns everything down. And then we have the river. What is it? What river goes up and down practically? The Mississippi. And they cross the Mississippi and into back into their home territory where around uh, the Great Lakes region. And that's our migration story. We never got near the Berry Strait. <laughs> and we have Wayut and Yurok in Northern California who are considered Algon a part of the Algonquian mm -hmm. family. Yeah. They love the salmon so much they stayed behind. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame them, by the way. But it was a lot of violence in there, but it also has a lot of lessons. Mm that needed to be told. I think it's in here, right? I think I, I said, I, meant, I mentioned that in, in, in here, the lessons involved in, in that. What do our stories tell us, the rolling head? When winter set in, there was time for the parents to tell sacred stories to their children. That's entertaining their children on long winter nights. They started to tell the sacred stories at the first fall of snow. I remember when I was a child there in our cabin, our parents would put lots of wood in the stove, light the candles, bundle us up, and warm, and, and in warm blankets, then we start telling the stories, and they start telling the stories. First, they told the story of Wisaki Jack. It is as if the stories were told to merely entertain the children, because the stories were funny, and Wisaki Jack did many silly things. But that was not their only purpose. The stories were educational. These stories contain lessons on how much to survive and how to survive in our world, which is always in flux. This is on page 227, if you're following. Uh, let's talk about the first story in the Wisaki Jack cycle called Chichibishigon, the rolling head. In this story, we find all the teachings of the circle of life. 227. One, there are four cardinal points in the flight of Wisaki Jack and his younger brother as they flee from the evil rolling head. Two, in the various characters who are in the story are represented four modes of mobility, walkers, swimmers, flyers, and crawlers. Three, four stages of life, infancy, adolescence, adulthood, and old age. Four, four orders of life, human, animal, plant, and mineral. And, and, mineral. and five, four elements, earth, fire, water, and air. 
the talisman that Uesaki Jack used during his fight. Four essential requirements for a healthy life, protection, nourishment, growth, and wholeness. Four aspects of human nature, emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual. The flight of the boys is essentially a pre-migration story from the east to the south, to the west, to the north, and back to the east. We were always here. We no longer tell our stories. When we no longer tell our stories, we lose all this education. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, the audience for questions very soon, but I want to ask you a couple more just before we, we do that. Sure. Um, and uh, that's basically like more related to your, your work as, as a, a Cree language teacher and a, a Cree language uh, keeper. And I wanted to ask you, like, what would you say, well, what would you say are the biggest challenge, the challenges today um, to teach in Cree to people who've lost their language? I think the biggest challenge is feeling discouraged. People laughing at you because you mispronounced the word. I remember going back home and I'd mispronounce a word in Cree and my mother would laugh. But that's how we are. We laugh a lot. Okay. But she'd laugh. But then she'd model the word for me. And in that, I learned how to say it. I didn't mind the laughter because that's part of us. But with her modeling the word, I was able to pick up the word and be able to use it properly. And that's the thing about that. We've got to remember, if we're going to laugh, show them how it's done. As one of my teachers used to say, if you're going to criticize something, go ahead. But please offer us an, an alternative. Mm -hmm. Always. And Otherwise, you're just complaining. <laughs> and what would you say to someone who's looking to learn their language? Uh, but they say, or someone who said, well, who's looking to learn their, their, their language and but says they want to learn, but it's too hard. Well, uh, the best students I've had are those people who have done their own homework. You know, like they go to class, but classrooms can only do so much. Class teachers can only show you the tools of building your language because we no longer go into a world where everybody's speaking the language, right? But we do have tools we could work with. We have books nowadays. We have online resources we could work with. And it's how much determination do you have in learning your language? Like some of my students have done exactly that. One of my students uh, only took Cree 100 and 101. And uh, he came with me to a language festival, storytelling session. My family was in there, so it was a really neat, it was a really wonderful uh, week. And I tell stories in the evening. and. Um, Toward the end of the week, uh, I asked my student, you want to tell a story? He's only had Cree 100 and 101. So he went ahead and told the story. From the top of his head, all in Cree. And my relatives are looking at him. The Mooney Owl. <laughs> <laughs> and they're listening to him. And he finishes the story. And I asked my brother, what do you think? How did he do that? I didn't do it. He did. He had determination to learn, and he spent a lot of extra time looking through the books of the resources he had, and, and also the resources he, he picked up from online. And every time he's, he spoke to me, he spoke in Cree. So it's that determination that will save the language. It's that determination that will help you retain the language in your head if you can be telling a story. And uh, some of my students do that to me. When they see me, they'll start talking in Cree to me. And some of my students are now teaching the introductory classes. Although they weren't fluent students, fluent speakers, they were able to, to do that. And in teaching the language, they also pick up more as they go along. And uh, 
And uh, sometimes they'll make a mistake and I'll tease them. As, uh, as occurred yesterday, I was writing something on, um, on Facebook about uh, coming into the airport and uh, one of the um, flight attendants was, the flight attendant who um, checked my, checked my uh, boarding pass and said, Solomon Rad, are you a Cree teacher? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, I said, yeah. Are you, are you taking a Cree class? And he said, yeah, I'm taking a Cree class from Darien. And, I said, <laughs> and then I posted that on Facebook. And then Darien says, writes down, ne gus game out. Gus. So I said, oh, you really miss him? <laughs> Just one little word, <laughs> one, little, one little letter. Nikaske mau, I I am lonesome for him. Or nikiske mau, kiss game mau. I know the person. Nikas, nikis. Okay, just one little thing. So I teased him about that, and he just laughed. And says, I didn't even re recognize that. <laughs> you know, which is really neat. And uh, but he does really well w with this stuff here, and uh, and he doesn't mind being corrected. And that's a thing. We have to remember, and that's the thing I learned when I was first took my my Cree one hundred that I had to be able to accept being corrected in the way. And in my case, the way I was writing things, right? And and uh, my teachers were really funny that way. They'd always tease me if I mis misrepresented something. It was really, <laughs> and that's the thing, you know. You want to learn? Put a little bit of of humility in your learning too. You know, if somebody if you say something wrong. It's okay if you said something wrong. If somebody is there to correct your, spell, your spelling or your enunciation of the word, they're there to help you. You know, if they're just laugh at you and not do anything, anything to correct you, then uh, you could kick them. <laughs> okay, one last question, and then you know I'll, I'll let you guys uh, ask questions. I just wanted to ask you, like, what? How about those people who say that it's a waste of time? You know that, and I've heard this actually. Uh, not so much from our people, although I, I have heard it uh, from some of our people that, you know, learning Cree is a waste of time, that our languages are all dying anyway, and that the future is English. What do we say to people like that? Uh, I would say, uh, why do you say that? You know, yeah. like, because I can't see it, you know, like it's a waste of time. I'd like to see a world where I walk down the streets of and see a sign in Cree or whatever language in that original language. And that's the thing we have to do is to be able to be proud of our language. Let's put signs up all over the place. Instead of stop, you can say, Nagi. Instead of yield, we can say, yeah, tak. <laughs> yeah. Traffic signs could be like that. We could have Closed captioned movies and cartoons. We could show our, we could show pride in our language, and that's the thing. You know, if we show pride in our language, the more more people will show pride in their language, and we won't people and we won't have that. It's just a waste of time, you know. Because I I I have heard the same thing from from the younger people. Why should we learn the language? Well, let's show the language. Let's talk the language. Let's show the language, the, the humor in the language that we have. You know, like let's use the language for whatever we can, whenever we can. And to be proud of a language, to be proud to speak the language, to be proud to be able to write the language. I should be able to say, I know how to write Cree. I know how to write Cree in SRO. And it's not Solomon Rathrosography, by the way. <laughs> It's standard Roman sargraphy. Okay. And I know how to write in syllabics. I love writing Cree in any way possible. My students can read syllabics. Just really good. And it's something that you need to do, is to, to do it constantly. If you're going to read syllabics properly, you know, you have to read. It's really neat. And so we, most publications we do are on uh, 
are in both standard room lithography and in uh, and in SRO and in syllabics. We see that in the Cree literacy network. And the more we sh the more we show our languages, the prouder people will, will be. I think that we could take care of that. You know, it's just a waste of time. Well, let's provide more in language information for them. You know, let's, let's not quit. Let's just keep yeah, on going and right. just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm retired. I love being retired, but that doesn't mean I'm going to quit writing. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing my brother-in-law asked me when I was when I was up at his place uh, three weeks ago. Are you still writing? <laughs> yeah, I'm still writing because <laughs> he was concerned that I, I retired. I don't want to do anything else. Well, I'm just retired from teaching. I'll still tell stories. I'll still write. So I'm going to turn it over now. Uh, Rene, did you want to take um, take on this part, like um, for the questions? Yeah, I'm hard of hearing, so you may I may have to ask you to repeat the question, or I'll get my mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell the story. Hey, Adam. It's good to see you. Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I kind of have a few comments. The first, I wanted to just say thank you for being here. But my question is, is I have been, I kind of got sidetracked on my language journey. I feel like I get super motivated and I disconnect. And I think it's largely because I'm in Tujage, like I'm not at home in my own community. Mm -hmm. So the language isn't as easily accessible here. So I feel like that's part of my journey, but now that I'm finishing up my master's, I really want to go to more towards like language and, and within our epistemologies, like learning more towards like, like how I'm teaching my kids right now is I'm taking certain parts of the moose hide or the moose practice and implementing words here and there, and I'm doing it through song as well. But I guess my question for that is how do I, like how long approximately, like I have a little bit of understanding and I can pick up words, but like how, how long would it take me to be a fluent language speaker? She's asking how long it's gonna take her to be a fluent language speaker. <laughs> if that I put is, in all the hard work I, and I, I don't promise I know how I long <laughs> that would be. <laughs> like I started learning English when I was six years old and I still have problems with English. I'm 69 now, so it's a lifelong thing, you know, and uh, I still have problems with that stuff. I went to a, I went, I went to a, a drive-in one time with, with, a, with my date, and she, she told me that uh, she was really, really cold, so I turned the heat up in the, in the, in the, in the car, and she said she was still cold. I guess that was a hint for me to hug her or something like that, but I didn't know that. <laughs> But this is cultural things, right? And uh, so I'm still learning lots of stuff in the English world on how to do things properly, you know. So it's going to be a lifelong thing, you know. It's just a matter of your determination. What are you going to do, you know? And you could go ahead and label everything around your house to be able to, to be able to remember everything, you know. Can can you can you imagine uh, your, one of your children's? You got a big sign on one of your children's forehead. Nico says, "My son." <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a silly comment, but but uh, you know that's the thing. A lot of people label their household just to, just to learn one word at a time as you go along. Sometimes and listen to the stories that are available online. There's a lot of stories on Cree Literacy Network that that are there in Cree and in English, and you can do that. And that's the thing you have to do is you have to keep trying and keep trying, and you have to try to speak Cree to the Cree speakers. Speak Cree to me. You know, you could get a, a t-shirt like that and you know, speak to speak Cree to me, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's the way you, that's the way you'll get to fluency. You won't get fully fluent. Like I say, I'm 69, I'm still not flu fully fluent in English. And um, but at least I'm a lot better at English than I did when I start when I started out in uh, in, uh, in residential school. I remember a kid coming up, one of my cousins coming into to residential school one time and he's just so great. It's one of these guys who will not get stumped by anything, right? And uh, it's, 
my second year at, at, at the residential school and, and the matron is asking this little guy, what is your name? Namani Pini, man. What is your name? Namani Pini, man. What is your name? Namani Pini, man. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Will you guys tell, ask this guy what, I'm, what his name is? And then we both we both start laughing. He's, she's asking you what your name is. Oh, Percy. My name is Percy. <laughs> and he says, and the major says, what did he say? He said, he didn't bring any lunch. <laughs> man, I didn't bring lunch. <laughs> he ended up being a teacher, by the way. <laughs> really good. But he tried, he learned, he learned, he learned English, and I learned English. And one of the things I had, I, I majored in English in university because I loved stories. English had everything. Stories have everything. Stories have psychology. Stories have history. Stories have spirituality. They have that. It's good. I just also want to just quickly share a little story about um, Solomon and me. I um, was doing, there's a traditional tattoo gathering in Ganesatage. Was it last year or two years ago? And I asked Solomon, I'm like, oh, I want to get a tattoo that says land back. And I said, I, and I did my own research. I went on Cree Atlas, which you showed me and did all of this like work. And then he starts laughing at me. He's like, oh, you're, you said the first word, right. But the second right was like back, which was my actual back. <laughs> He's like, it's a good thing that you didn't get that tattoo before you asked me. <laughs> And he ended up like doing this beautiful uh, tattoo on the back here, the, the syllabics for me. So, and it says, "Let's take our land back." Anyways, can I ask Gomitin Solomon? Now she went no type of thing. Watch, watch here. A kuni hidden the Eastern Cree. Stishiyim hidden. So, uh, anyways, I just said that I'm speaking to you in Eastern Cree. So I'm uh, I'm very pleased for for you to come here. I saw you at First Nation University, uh, and uh, I went to the your talk and uh, Dorothy Thunder. That was like ten years ago. However, I was disappointed because everyone else went to the uh, reconciliation bandwagon, I called it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said she saw me speaking, but she was disappointed that not so many people showed up because they all went so, to the reconciliation bandwagon. <laughs> Let me comment on that, right? Okay. I think I remember that uh, a few of us showed up on there, and one of my colleagues says, there's hardly anybody here. And I said, well, what do you expect? We're talking about language. Nobody cares. And everybody's mouth just dropped. And I said, I've been teaching for 30 years. And this is what I've seen in the past 30 years. People say language is important. Language is so important to our culture. But when it comes down to it, nobody cares. But it's changing now. It's really good to see this shift. You know, that's one of the things that I really like about my career is that I've seen that shift. People are really caring nowadays. I wanted to, to say comment now on Concordia. Because <laughs> I, I was here and I was since I was 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 doing a conference and I was I was asked to uh, to do a presentation on Cree language and I did. <laughs> and there was only like three four people in the in the audience you know and i was so disappointed and i said i'm not going to give any more talks on language you know because but however here i'm glad to see that there there are more than three here you know <laughs> and there's some more in the uh, uh on the webinar you know yeah. and there's about 15 i, I think uh, that are listening in so i'm uh I just want to say thank you for those who are showing up to the Naskomit Nog or we we discuss Masia or you Yemen. Yeah, yeah. It's taking time. Yeah, I want to look to go with Dukshinia go. 
a datum higuiaguin yemon cas you know within this it's the decade of indigenous languages so i'm just saying that um thank you for the people who are showing up now for the uh for 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 solomon's presentation you know for the uh for caring for the indigenous languages so it's in the nash comet no so and i'm i'm uh i'm lower on the uh years of learning english you know i'm just 35 years learning english and english is my third language so i still have a long way to go <laughs> <laughs> i'm just trying to encourage uh, autumn here for the for the cree you know so uh, yeah and people still laugh at me when i speak uh, because of my thick cree accent you know so but i'm proud of it yeah so uh so uh, thank you, Solomon, for being here, for coming over, and to Manon for uh, moderating this misty, misty. She's thanking you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Charlotte. I see your comment there. I see the comments Hello, on, Solomon. The, on the web. Nice to finally meet you. My name is Colleen. Um, I have a question for you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I'll, um, she, no, it's okay. Go ahead and I'll repeat oh, okay. it. Yeah, she'll sure. tell me. Yeah. She'll tell me. Sure. My question is, um, as you know, I'm a beginner learner, and many Cree teachers have told me that language is also very important because it connects you to the land. And I'm wondering, as a person who's lived in a, a city for a, a large part of your life teaching, do you still feel that connection? And what do you say to beginner learners who who do live in cities? Will they still feel that connection? Is that something they will have to actively seek out or through the language they will begin to understand these concepts? Thank you. So she's asking if like when you live in the city, do you still have that connection that you're learning to speak Greek? Do you still have that connection to land when you're not on the land? Yeah. I do personally. I, I feel that I do have the connection uh, to the land, but I think that's because I, I I go for walks in the park as much as I can, and it's really nice to get back. Like just before we came here, Rebecca and I went for a walk up on Mount Mount Royal. You know, so I so I go out for a connection to the land when I go walking, and. Uh, and I need to do that. And during my walks, I'll set tobacco down to be able to give thanks for another day. You know, so you live in the city, there are parks you could go to. And I'm lucky that I, I live where I am because there's two little islands that are, uh, that are in the park I go to and they sort of like the wildernesses. <laughs> and, I, and I love that in that area. And yeah, so I keep that in mind. and. Uh, and I'm grateful today too that that I can still speak Cree, that uh, that I still have relatives who speak Cree. Most of us in my generation ended up going to residential school, but my generation, uh, most of us still speak Cree. And, uh, and we have connection to our stories. Uh, we still we still uh, we used to we used to speak Cree on a sly or as in as the way you would say in Cree, Kimuch. <laughs> on the Kimuch. We used to speak Cree on the Kimuch and uh, and what as a residential school my residential school was surrounded by farmland and bush along the way and uh, and we were able to go for walks out there which helped me with the connection of the land and there it's really neat. and we spoke Cree to each other Whenever the teachers or the uh, or the supervisors weren't around, we, we spoke Cree to each other, and it was good that way. Uh, on Zoom from Charlotte Ross, I love your session today, Solomon Nimochikitan. If, if anyone else on Zoom has a question or a comment, they can uh, turn on their cameras, or they can raise their hand, or put it in the chat. So I, I, yeah, if anybody out there has a question, you could go ahead and put it on chat. 
one uh, concerning translation. What? Um, translation. Translation of what? Well, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the question is concerning translation. It's coming. Oh, okay, it's coming. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Solomon, I know that you taught translation uh, at least once from Cree to English or from English to Cree. Uh, can you talk a little bit okay, about yeah. this experience to yeah. teaching translation into indigenous languages? Translation from Cree to English is really hard sometimes or, for, or vice versa, English to Cree. In order to be a good translator, you have to be fluent in both languages you're working with. I read a lot of Scandinavian literature that's been translated to English. And sometimes there are really gross errors in English grammar in those translations, basically because they're translations, you know. And also in my case, there's a lot of stuff that I have in this book that I translated from Cree to English, and the English is really awkward. But that's to try to capture the, the, the rhythm of the Cree language. You know, I know how to write English sentences, but trying to translate word for word makes it really hard. And lately what I've been doing is instead of translating word for word, I'll go to interpretation. You know, like the word uh, reconciliation. What in the world is that? How did we Come upon this word, why is it such a catchphrase to score government funds? Reconciliation means setting things right. Setting things right in Cree. So we have to interpret reconciliation and we also have to in my case i thought reconciliation also means you know like these two parodies did wrong to each other the children maybe included didn't do anything wrong i don't need to do anything here but i've come to a point where i have to reconcile reconcile my trauma from that experience it's my job to heal from that trauma. And in that way, that reconciliation happens. And uh, you're, you're faced with a lot of, a lot of uh, challenges when, uh, when you're trying to translate. Like in, on Facebook, somebody asked the other day, how do you say deadly? <laughs> oh, you're so deadly. Rene, you're so deadly. <laughs> <laughs> Try to translate that in Cree, right? It literally means, boy, you're dead. <laughs> so this is a case where you go into interpretation. Deadly. Tagake. Tagake meaning great stuff, awesome, which, which is what deadly means, mm -hmm. from my understanding, right? I was teaching in China one year, uh, 87, 88, and I got called to the principal's office because I'd been misbehaving as usual. There's a story in that. <laughs> so I got called to the office and I told my students, okay, hang out for a little while while I, while I go to the office. So I went to see the, the principal and I come back to the classroom and there's my students, my Chinese students looking in their dictionaries, looking at the window, looking in their dictionaries, because they were trying to literally translate hang out. That's why they were looking at the window as they're hanging out the window, right? So when you go into interpretation uh, translation, and inter sometimes you have to ignore that literal translation of certain words. You have to go into the interpretation. Hang out, what does that mean in other words? That's one of the exercises that we did in our English classes. You know, we'd go in, into uh, literature, we'll go into a, a, a poetry, and people will say, paraphrase this poem in your own words. That's basically what you're doing when you're paraphrasing a poem. You're interpreting the poem with your own words. Now, 
do not go gentle with that good night rage rage against the night that kind of stuff and what do you say in english you know you can try to translate these things and i've had a lot of practice with in translation like this book here that way in the magic hat there were a lot of words in english buffy's words that were not possible in creed so i've had to interpret i made up a word for uh, a possum here because we don't have possums in a word in creek it's in here somewhere but i can't remember where it is you know what i did what i did was basically i looked in i looked on google and i found a word a kickable word for 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 uh what is it pasquatomy it's either pasquatomy or uh, kickable and they had a word for opossum in there so it's a, a, a language related to cree right so i bought i got that word from that particular language and used it for for a possum on there and then uh, eric says where'd you get that word so i told him about what our, our Kesson language has that word so let's use it opossum opossum is basically that's what English people adopted that word from the, that indigenous language. So I just said, oh, awesome. And that's what it's in here somewhere. So it had to do with some, some research, some cre creative thinking. And also, uh, Baltimore Orioles. We have no word for Baltimore Oriole in Cree. But at Tehana Autumn in, South, in, uh, South, in the American Southwest in, in uh, Arizona, call these birds sunbirds in their language sunbirds so i used that be some ways i just went ahead and used interpreted that be some ways so i created a word for baltimore oriole you based on another language and that, that's what you have to do a lot of times when you're interpreting and translating you have to see what other languages have done for this for this thing and how can we adopt it to our language Thank you. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Hang on, there's a question on, uh, on, on, on chat. Let's, let's okay. take care of that. Yeah, it's from uh, Rafael, Rafael Bosco. Thank you, Mr. Rad, for this conference. My question would be, what do you think about non-indigenous people learning an indigenous language? Do you think there is some kind of issue with teaching the language to somebody with no cultural or ancestral ties to it? I love it when other people of non-indigenous ancestry come in my classroom learning language. They want to learn the language. And uh, because learning a language is, is healing in itself. You're learning another culture as you go along. You have, you're opening your eyes to another world view. You know, and it's just wonderful to see. And that's how the world gets better because people are being more and more open-minded about things. You know, let's say, you know, why pretend to be an Indian? Why not accept your own culture? Be proud of your own culture. And then when you're proud of your own culture, you also appreciate everybody else's culture and you can share that kind of stuff, share share cultural views, share, share and, um, share words share share humor and uh and when i when i see non-indigenous people in my classroom i always say oh, this is so great to see you know and uh, i've had more non-indigenous people in my classrooms than there has been uh, indigenous people you know in the past 30 years and, and it's been that's I've, I've loved it and these people go out into the world and they're more accepting of uh, first nations people when they work with them it's a good thing Okay, now for, I hope that answer is good. Okay. Uh, Hi, Denise. Hi, I'm Salman. Um, Alma, Alma mentioned, I think, that it's a decade of the um, indigenous language. And taking that into consideration, what, what are some dream, dreams that you would have um, for 10 years from now for indigenous languages to be used more widely like what, what do you see 
maybe in schools or on street signs or that sort of thing as resulting um, from a successful decade of indigenous languages being promoted. I would love to see children playing, talking, yelling at each other in Cree. I'd love to see that in the playground, you know, I hope to see that one of these days where we're all yelling at each other, you know, I was, oh yeah. <laughs> Even little words, right? That's what I'd love to see is basically these children are having fun. And, uh, and also I'd love to see uh, some cartoons in Cree. There are, there are people who are working on some films who are wanting to do Cree stuff. And uh, we're going to be seeing some, some of that in a little while. And, uh, and in 10 years time, there'll be more people doing that. And, uh, you know, like a lot of people are more accepting of the way we write Cree in standard Roman orthography. A lot of more people are more accepting of it to, today than they were five years ago, even. You know, and we get this uh, negative feedback a lot of times from other Cree speakers. They say, Cree was never a written language, we shouldn't be writing it. Well, no language in the world started out as a written language. People got to remember that. English people started writing their language back in the 1300s, right? 12? Somewhere around there. It took a long time. It took a, you know, look at how, look at how Chaucer wrote. <laughs> You know, middle, middle English, like uh, try to read that, like part of my, uh, part of the university class, Chaucer class is to get the students to read, read Chaucer in Middle English, and they're reading Chaucer, and everybody's, duh, is that English? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it took a long time for the English language itself to be where it's at today. Aluminum, we say that here in Canada. They say aluminium in Australia, but it's spelled the same. Some of us say Toronto. Some people say Toronto, but no matter how they say it, it's still spelled the same. I'm going to drink some water. 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 <laughs> no matter how I say it, I still spell the same way. Hang on. I used to have to translate for an English, an English friend of mine when she'd ask for water in the restaurant because the, the server wouldn't understand what she was saying. <laughs> she wants water. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, people make fun of my English pronunciation sometimes, which is really fun. You know, I love it. And uh, like, I can't say those nice little crispy apples that grow that are really bitter. Crab apples? I think it's crab apples. I don't know what. How do you say that word? <laughs> but it'll be spelled the same no matter what, right? I still can't say that darn word. <laughs> but how did I get to that comment? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but that's the thing. So in 10 years' time, we're going to be seeing a lot of more production in Cree. We're going to see a lot of uh, production uh, online stuff. We're going to see a lot of um, films in Cree. Uh, some 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 closed captioning is in Cree, and uh, some of the stuff that we've put on in Cree Literacy Network actually has a closed captioning at the bottom with what's what's being said in Cree, written in Cree, and that is so good to be able to teach the language that way. And there'll be more of that in the ten years' time. And you could hear other people telling more stories. Like it's, it's really nice. Like the stories are there in here, and in here and here and here and here you know there's more resources like it sure is a lot more done nowadays and how did i start writing and basically i have a, a textbook matching it here we textbook let me tell you uh, how that came about this one student showed up in my class for the fourth time
So it was spring class. So after class, I asked her to stay behind. And I asked, why do you keep taking my class? And, I, I, and you keep failing it. You could take it from somebody else. He said, well, I don't want anybody else to teach me. I want you. I want this class from you. And he said, Let's make a deal. OK. Come to class every day. Take notes. I know, I know exams and quizzes are really hard for you, but I want you to do them too. Take notes of everything we say, and at the, end of, uh, at the end of the term, your term project is your notes for this class. Yeah. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> because of his notes, I, uh, her notes, I was able to write match in the hair weight when beginning Cree. I worked from there. And all through these years, I've had to write notes along the way as we go along. And uh, and it's just so nice to be able to write those things, write those words down, to be able to write stuff. I'm lost. I can't remember what I was saying. <laughs> was I answering a question? <laughs> Can I? Um, I okay. I um, I wanted to comment about the the earlier one that said about uh, learn, uh, teaching teaching a language to other non-indigenous. Uh, uh people so my comment on it is that um as long as long as there's no um resources because there is there are a lot of indigenous people who would like to le learn their language and as long as it's not taking away resources from indigenous people i am for it you know uh, that's my general comment because uh, my husband is non-indigenous too and I teach him a little bit, you know, but it's not taking resources from other indigenous people. So that's why I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I'm saying that, you know, because there's very, very little money spent across Canada for indigenous languages and that's part of it that we are in the state that we are now, you know. Uh, it's not only residential schools, but it's lack of funding for uh, indigenous languages. So that's just my comment on that. Uh, and now my question is, you know, uh, to Solomon and to is, is there is the truth and reconciliation calls to action. And there is something there about the universities what they also they're called to do in terms of indigenous languages so what would you encourage universities such as because in quebec you know there's a lack of many language resources mm -hmm. for indigenous languages what would you encourage the universities to do? I would encourage universities to uh, keep creating classes in various levels. Like my university, uh, First Nations University, has classes from introductory Cree, so, uh, Cree 100, 101, and then we have uh, other classes that deal with the uh, oral tradition in Cree. And we have uh, also we have uh, Cree literature and translation, and we have Cree 100, Cree 205, Cree 202. All, we have a wide range of classes. And universities need to continue doing that. And another thing that needs to happen is that federal governments and tribal governments and provincial governments need to recognize the importance of our First Nations languages. Like some of you are employed by the federal government. And I bet you the, the uh, 
the French people get extra money because they speak French. The same thing should happen for indigenous languages. You should get extra money because you speak French. I know a federal employee who, wanted, who, took, uh, who took French classes and said that in his, in his uh, document and he got extra money because he spoke French. That needs to happen on the federal government. We used to have that in our, in our tribal nation, in the Laclaran Indian Band. People who spoke Cree used to get extra benefits on account of that. They no longer do that, but they did at one time. And they're fighting for that now to, to bring, bring that back. You know? So we need to create more classes. We need to create an atmosphere where uh, we recognize our traditional stories as educational stories. They're not there just for kids' entertainment. They're not fairy tales. They're much more important than that, than, than the ordinary fairy tales. And we need to do all that kind of stuff. And a lot of that stuff is happening. And I hope to see a, a better use of our languages. And we're going to be continuously arguing about how to spell certain things. I don't think, I don't, I don't even bother getting into arguments about those anymore. And uh, I used to get into trouble because I'd go ahead and, and correct people in, with their spellings on Facebook. I no longer do that. I will if I have an agreement with that person. If that person says, yes, please correct my Cree, then I will correct. A lot of times I'll do it through the private message on inbox. But sometimes if I know that the, that person is very willing to see to see her error on, on there, I'll correct it. Correct it on there. You know. And that's the thing. We have to be able to put our pride in our back pocket. In their back pocket and say, okay, teach me. Show me what I have. I speak the TH language and I've taught the Y dialect for the past 37 years, for almost 40 years. You know, that's not so easy to go from one dialect to another, you know, and um, when I go home, they laugh at me because I'm talking, I'm talking Y dialect. And when I, when I, when I come back to the South, they laugh at me because I'm actually went back to the TH dialect. You know, <laughs> it's been a struggle along the way. And the struggle is also evident in my writing. I'll start writing something and I'm thinking it's uh, in, in the Y dialect, but it turns out it's a TH dialect. So I'm grateful I have, uh, uh, have people I work with that, that will proofread my writing and they'll say, uh, Solomon, I think that is uh, TH spelling. Right, okay. <laughs> and then I have to go into the Y dialect, you know, and, I, and I've had to do that too. I've had to say, okay, teach me. You know, I'm not perfect here. Please teach me how, if I'm doing the wrong, wrong dialect here. And, uh, and it's, it's so nice to be able to have that exchange with people, to be able to have that openness, to be able to say, okay, I'm going to make mistakes in my writing. Uh, I mean, how many of you were really proficient in your writing when you started writing, right? With your spelling? I don't think any of us <laughs> did that, right? Even today, we have a hard time trying to spell. A lot of times, and, uh, and so don't get discouraged because you spelled a Cree word wrong. It's normal. It's part of your learning process. You know, the only word that I've seen that hasn't been misspelled is uh, chisk. <laughs> People seem to know how to spell that. C-I-S-K. It means ass for those of you who don't know. <laughs> But kids love that, right? I'm corrupting you guys, sorry. We have uh, two comments on Zoom. I can oh, yeah. read okay. them to Hold you uh, from okay. uh, Céline Parrain. Uh, qu'on salue. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and stories with us. What about the NHL games commented in Cree on TV? Any comments? I think that is such a great development. And you know, all these people, and they, these people have had to make up words for those kind of stuff, right? It is really neat. And uh, it's great to see the language operating that way. 
and uh, he shoots, he scores, huh? You know, <laughs> and they had to also make up a word for puck mm -hmm. and football. So it's creativity. It's just really wonderful to see on on uh, on TV in public media, and uh, that was another step forward toward being able to be proud of our language. I love that. I love seeing that. Another comment from uh, Bernadine Ole Steinhauer. Will, so that one I can answer to that. Will a list of all the textbooks uh, he is referencing be available to us? So I can answer that. We have um, a page on Facebook if you uh, if you are connected to Facebook, it's called uh, L'Observatoire de la Traduction Autochtone. We will give a list of the books from uh, by Solomon Rat, and it will be available on that soon. And another comment, I, I will need help for that one, from uh, Charlotte Ross. Uh, we need a world, where, a world where Cree is the norm. Na yesta pokota nei ya yak ekwa mena Tanehita Wayak. That was yeah. great, you said it right. Yes. Yeah, this is really good. We always have to speak Cree, is what it says. And for us to speak Cree to each other or something like that. She, his pronunciation was great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Maybe. Charlotte, thank you for that. Um, maybe uh, we have time for a last I think question. We have time for more um, questions, I think. Uh, or comments. Debbie, maybe I would like uh, to ask Debbie Folaron who to to ask a question or to give I a comment. She is a, a colleague in translation, and she uh, she encourages me very much to invite you. So she's kind of the the the. The origin story of your of you coming to Montreal. Thank you. Okay. Um, one, my I have several questions, but I won't ask them all. One question I'm curious about: um, How do you translate in Cree the word "translate"? And the word interpret. Translate? How do you say translate in Cree? It mm -hmm. is the It is the is to translate something. It is the It is the magi when. It is the magi comes and say. Stem, mm -hmm. say something for someone. Magi, mm -hmm. translate for someone. Okay. Some, translate that stuff. And, uh, but, Going back to tradition, this word here, if I was a young man and I wanted to get married, I would go to my uncle and I'd ask him to do a win. It do a win for saying, please go speak on my behalf. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> for her hand in marriage, in other words. This is really super. Yeah. You know? So it's just. Mm -hmm. What it, that's what it is. It does the magi when the translation is basically you're going from one to another, the transference mm -hmm. of one worldview to another worldview. Mm -hmm. And my my other question is, um, I know that there are something like seventy or eight, eighty dialects or different languages. I'm sorry, not dialects, different First Nations languages. Given the 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 lack or the reduced um uh the few resources to devote to all of these languages how are the decisions made as to what languages get taught for example we were just mentioning at university and languages is and are there any difficulties are there any um discussions in amongst first nations groups about this, are there are there politics involved? <laughs> She's wondering, like, how do the universities decide which languages to teach? Are there politics involved? There's always politics involved in language. <laughs> There's always politics involved in language, and uh, like at our university, we love to have our languages written in our pamphlets, but. First Nations University 
uh, is made for is made is uh, basically our First Nations University, and we have Dakota in the province, we have Nakota in the province, we have Dene, we have Soto, we have Cree, and when we start doing something in one of the languages, we also have to do everything in the other languages. So it's really, really, really political, and that's that's there. But here in Montreal, we have how many languages around us, right? <laughs> I can't even begin to think how many languages they are, and so it's just really a, a decision that the university makes needs to make. You know, most of the time, what happens at my university is we'll just ignore. <laughs> ignore the thing and because uh, sometimes we have a hard time finding people who can actually do Dene or Dakota. It's easy to find somebody in uh, Cree or Soto in, in my area, but then the other tribes get feel feeling left out, ne neglected. So it's just really touchy a lot of times. You have to really, really, uh, it's like walking on eggshells or as somebody says, uh, it's like porcupines making love. Very carefully, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you start doing your, your planning for indigenous languages, you not only have to determine what language you're going to teach, but you also have to determine what writing system you're going to use. And that's the problem in this area right now, because we have various Cree groups here and they all want to teach. <laughs> they all want to write the different way. And we have the same thing uh, uh, happening in our, in our province. Uh, the, we have in our province we have th dialect y dialect and n dialect and the n dialect people want to write their own way so we just have to let them go and what's happened short, on, throughout history in the teaching uh, let's say we have some a teacher coming into our into elementary school or high school and they have to create their own materials as they go along but then a couple of years later they move on to a different job and they have to bring in a new 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 Cree teacher and that new Cree teacher can't work with the stuff that your previous teacher had worked with because that previous teacher was writing Cree in the way she understood Cree. <laughs> so, you know, material sharing was impossible. So everybody has to start recreating their own work, their own stuff like that. And that's what that's what happened in the past. But nowadays we have a standard room orthography and we try to teach people how to teach with this, how to read this stuff, and they have more resources to go with. And right now we have elementary teachers going in who have barely taken, who have only taken one or two Cree classes, you know, and they're teaching Cree language classes to the elementary students. But their pronunciation is good because they know how to do the SRO. They're not fluent, but they could teach the basics of the language with the correct pronunciation. And the two, and school boards have to decide they're going to, going to go that way. And they, I've seen so much, so many language teachers quitting because they get lateral violence from the communities. Mm. That's not how we do that. That's not how we say that. We shouldn't tell stories in the summertime. Oh, that's the other one. I'm getting a lot of stuff. We get all this stuff and we have to overcome that. So any language issue is fraught with a lot of politics that we had to work through. Thank you very much. We have to conclude. So uh, thank you to Solomon Brad. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, it was, if you knew me, you'd know how my stomach was really just turning like crazy before the presentation. <laughs> I get nervous every time. I've been doing this for 40 years and I still get nervous. <laughs> And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. And thank you to Manon for, uh, for leading the conversation. Okay, thank you to everyone uh, coming into the Force Space today and for activating this conversation. For everybody online, uh, those of you here in the space also, thank you for everything. We'll be closing up the Zoom and the live stream, but just want to let you know, a quick reminder, the conversation is already available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit or share it. So please join us again if you can, and have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>